Uh, this is part two of graph spectral image processing tutorial in ICIP 2020. Uh, I'm Jean Chao, I'm associate professor in York University in Toronto, Canada. Uh, we're going to talk about graph learning and image compression in this part. Before I get started, I want to give uh, thanks to my colleagues who have provided slides for me uh, in today's presentation. Uh, professor Wei Hu in Peking University, uh, Enrico Macri in Palo Tecnico, uh, to Torino. Uh, Thomas Moche in INRIA, and uh, Antonio Ortega in University of Southern California. I give thanks also to uh, my group members uh, in my research group in York, uh, my postdocs, grad students, and visiting uh, researchers. So here's the outline of today's presentation. Uh, it's breaking up into two parts. Uh, in the first part, we're going to talk about graph learning, uh, different ways of learning a graph, which is important because when you're given an image, it's not naturally a signal on a graph. Uh, after we talk about graph learning, we're going to talk about uh, uh, image compression. Uh, so how we're going to use uh, learn graph or uh, different techniques to, to do the image compression. So we start with graph learning. We'll talk about the different groups of techniques. Uh, actually, group uh, graph learning is a, it's a well-studied problem. Uh, it continues being studied in the literature. Uh, we'll just highlight the, the main ones that, uh, in our opinions, are the most important ones. Uh, and leave out some of the other ones. Uh, as I was saying, uh, graph signal processing, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly new topic to study uh, spectral analysis tools for signals that residing on graphs. Uh, but image is not typically on a graph. Uh, so uh, if you're given an image on a 2D grid, for example, what is the appropriate graph? Uh, it's an important question. Of course, there are modern in, uh, imaging data, such as uh, 3D point clouds, uh, that are not uh, on a 2D grid. In this case, it's just uh, points in 3D space. Uh, even in this case, you have to ask, okay, how do you connect these points in 3D space into a graph because you can, before you can apply uh, GSP techniques. Uh, graph typically re, uh, conveys a pairwise relationship. Uh, so usually when you have two nodes, uh, I and J, and they're connected, uh, the weights, WIJ has to convey uh, some kind of uh, similarity information, right? either through a statistical notion, a correlation, uh, how, how correlated are they if they are uh, regarded as random variables, or there's a notion of a feature distance. Uh, so if they're associated with some feature vector, FI and FJ, uh, how can you compute a feature distance with respect to these nodes uh, given your feature vectors? So we start with uh, some st uh, statistical notions first. Uh, so if you think of uh, graph signals uh, as a, uh, a random vector uh, that is generated by a Gaussian Markov random field, for example, uh, then when you have many observations of this graph signal, you're essentially trying to estimate the, uh, the precision matrix that describes the statistical process. So uh, in this particular case, you'll be uh, given uh, an empirical uh, matrix, empirical uh, covariance matrix, and you're trying to find uh, a sparse precision matrix, uh, theta in this case, that matches your uh, observation, this empirical covariance matrix. Uh, in this particular case, the first two terms are kind of like the likelihood term that matches your uh, empirical uh, covariance matrix. Uh, and then you have a sparsity term that says, uh, the assumption is that the, uh, the precision matrix should be sparse. So this is graphical lasso. Uh, lasso come from the fact that you have uh, an L1 norm in the objective function. Uh, and then uh, there exist techniques that try to solve this uh, objective function through a block coordinate descent uh, algorithm that essentially uh, iteratively uh, optimize one row and one column at a time uh, of your precision matrix. Uh, while guaranteeing the matrix is uh, positive definite. So this technique is, uh, goes back to 2008, but it's still one of the more, more cited uh, technique uh, in the literature. Now, the interesting thing here is that there's really actually no notion of graph. It's just a notion of a precision matrix, uh, a sparse precision matrix. Uh, and it doesn't, there's, no, there's no concept of graph frequencies uh, in this at all. Uh, one point of note is that graphical lasso performs well and it satisfies this uh, uh, alpha incoherence condition, which is not always true. Uh, 
uh, which motivates this uh, second scheme, which is called the C-line, which stands for constraint L1 minimization uh, for inverse matrix estimation. The formulation is actually uh, have a very similar idea. This is saying, uh, given a, a, a covariance matrix, uh, empirical covariance matrix, I want to uh, compute an inverse covariance matrix or the precision matrix so that it's very close. And when you multiply by the covariance matrix, uh, it's very close to identity matrix. Right? So you want to make sure there's a, this is kind of like the fidelity term in my previous equation. You want to be faithful to your, uh, your observation, which in this case is the empirical covariance matrix. Uh, and then you would assume this, uh, the matrix is sparse. So you will minimize the L1 norm. Again, the L1 norm is the uh, convexification of the L0 norm, uh, which is the sparsity count uh, in your matrix. And now you use the L1 norm, uh, which is convex. So it turns out that this problem uh, here can be easily solved using a, a linear programming uh, formulation. So uh, it can, actually can be efficiently solved. Uh, unlike the previous uh, graphical lasso, it does not have to satisfy any uh, alpha incoherence condition. So this is what the, the author in this paper claimed that they, in some cases, you perform better than, than the graphical lasso. Uh, as I was saying, that these two uh, techniques that I just mentioned, uh, graphical lasso and C-line, are pure statistical approach. They actually make assumption about, they make no assumption about the structure of your graph. Now, if you want to have some assumption about the structure of your graph, uh, Antonio uh, Ortega and his, and his students in USC actually proposed this uh, approach, which actually is quite similar to graphical lasso. You can see this these two terms here are quite similar to the, uh, the terms in the graphical lasso. But now you're subjecting your uh, precision matrix, uh, interpreted as a Laplacian matrix uh, with some structural constraint. So uh, in particular, they consider three different types of graph Laplacian matrix, uh, generalized graph Laplacian, uh, diagonally dominant uh, generalized graph Laplacian, and combinatorial graph Laplacian. So that's kind of the general assumption that you can make for your uh, graph. Uh, and based on these constraints, you would have different solutions for, for this, uh, to solve this optimization problem. So again, the key difference between this algorithm and the previous two is that now you're really considering the precision matrix as a graph of Laplacian matrix, and then you can make uh, assumption on, uh, on these graph structures. So for example, uh, uh, certain connections has to be zero because you assume there are no edges. Uh, edges should be positive only and, and so on. So all those uh, algorithms that I previously talked about uh, assume you have multiple observations uh, of your graph signal on the same graph first, right? That's how you can compute the empirical covariance matrix. But there are cases when uh, you just don't have multiple observations. The multiple observations are just not available. So in that case, how do you compute a graph? So this could be relevant in cases, uh, uh, as I've shown here, uh, where um, you want to do a graph-based classification. For example, you have these uh, uh, images. You want to classify the images between a uh, cat, uh, cat and a dog. Um, and then uh, if images that are similar, uh, you would want to attach them with a large weight. And images that are different, you want to attach a small weight. Then in that case, uh, how do you assign the appropriate edge weights uh, from which you can do graph-based classification, right? Uh, in this case, you certainly don't have multiple observations of the graph signal, right? Because you only have, uh, for example, partial observations. You only know uh, maybe some of these images are cats and dogs. And uh, then how do you, con how do you uh, construct the appropriate graph? So in this case, the notion of feature distance uh, makes sense, right? So let's say each of these uh, images are, are attached with a feature vector. And then uh, if they have two different feature vectors, uh, and then the feature distance between them are large, you would assign a small weight. If the feature distance is small, you assign a large weight, right? Uh, so how do you define a feature distance? Now, uh, in the machine learning literature, there's a notion of mapless Mahanabit's distance, which essentially is computing the distance between two features through a metric matrix, M. Uh, 
So uh, you have two nodes, uh, I and J, uh, associated with uh, Fi and Fj. The distance between these two guys uh, is computed uh, using this equation, right? So it's basically, it's like an inner product uh, using a positive definite matrix M. Now having this distance, you can then compute the edge weight uh, between node I and J as exponential or minus the distance, right? So large distance, small weight, uh, small distance, large weight. So this notion of feature distance makes sense. Uh, of course, the question is how do you compute the optimal metric? Uh, so this is something that uh, uh, Wei and I looked at before. Uh, so suppose we assume the objective is as uh, a graph of Poisson regularizer and you want to minimize the metric given that you have some observations, right? Again, you have some nodes that you know, uh, for example, are have uh, associative labels, let's say zero and ones. Uh, so in this case, these xi and x, uh, xj's are actually known. And you know the edge weight uh, are computed uh, as an exponential of minus the feature distance, right? Then you can actually say, I want to minimize x transpose Lx using m as the variable, given that I know uh, some of the labels, right? Uh, you want to make sure that the uh, matrix M that you're solving is positive definite, uh, and then you want to bound uh, the trace of M to be some number. Otherwise, you can have infinite, uh, when you compute these uh, metric distance, you can have an uh, infinite distance. You want to avoid that. So this is the problem we looked at in one of our papers, uh, and we actually propose an identity composition freeway uh, on optimizing this M. Uh, in, in the paper I cited earlier, uh, propose a plot coordinate descent algorithm. Uh, and then a, a, a more recent paper uh, actually have an even faster method of doing that. So I won't go into the details here. Uh, this is just to show you that uh, even in the case when you don't have multiple observation or a graph signal, uh, you can nonetheless compute uh, a reasonable graph called feature graph, given that associated with uh, each node of a feature vector. Uh, using this notion of feature graph, you can actually compute uh, uh, a reasonable graph from which you can do different uh, uh, image operations, uh, such as uh, 3D point cloud denoising. Uh, you can look at the details in this paper, and you can see uh, the denoising results is quite good uh, relative to our competitors. Uh, similarly here, this is another set of results uh, compare our results to some of our competitors will do quite well. Uh, again, this notion of feature uh, graph learning is uh, appropriate for many, many uh, applications. So in this case, we also study uh, the problem of point cloud uh, enhancement. And this is different from the previous problem in the sense that we assume your point cloud is generated from a set of depth images. And these depth images suffer from both quantization uh, and noise corruption. So the model is more than just additive noise in the point cloud domain. Uh, the, the formation model is actually the depth measurements suffering from quantization noise uh, and additive noise. So then the idea is to uh, enhance the depth map directly before you do 3D point cloud synthesis, before you start mixing up the, the different uh, depth measurements to create your point clouds. Uh, the commonality is the fact that uh, when we enhance these uh, depth pixels, we still assume that you have a feature graph uh, that, relate, uh, that relates your different depth pixels uh, from which you can do processing. So I won't go through the details here, but this is just an, an example of where uh, we can use a feature graph uh, to connect your, your pixels from which you can do enhancement or denoising. Uh, this is very interesting work from uh, Antonio's group. Uh, so they ask a very fundamental question, uh, which is that uh, typically when you construct a graph, you either use a K nearest neighbor graph or you use something like a, a epsilon neighborhood graph. What that means is that you uh, either have a notion of distance and you say, well, I want to uh, pick the K closest distance uh, Let's say, oh, I want my closest two, it's uh, K and J, and I stop there, and then anything that's further away, uh, there will be no more connection. Uh, but how do you pick K? This is a tricky thing to do. Uh, 
Now, similarly for epsilon, you would say, well, I want, given a notion of distance, I want uh, to keep my neighbors no further than uh, epsilon distance away. But how do you pick epsilon? That seems like a tricky thing to do as well. So instead of picking these uh, tricky parameters, uh, Antonio and his team uh, came up with this idea uh, of NNK graph, which means uh, non-negative kernel uh, regression. The, the idea is quite interesting. Uh, it comes from a sparse signal approximation perspective uh, and is related to local linear embedding. Um, so let me um, talk about this in, in this slide. So, so the idea is that um, if you have a kernel trick that tells you the uh, similarity uh, measure between two, two nodes, so for example, it could be this exponential kernel that I talked about uh, with some uh, fe feature distance. Uh, and then uh, once you have this uh, kernel trick that maps you to this similarity measure, uh, then you can say, uh, I want to represent a signal using a, uh, a linear combination uh, of my neighbors, right? Where uh, K, uh, S here will be the set of neighbors that you would have. Again, this is a generalization of uh, local linear embedding. Uh, and using this, uh, solving this to find a set of neighbors actually will remove some kind of redundancy. And here's a good illustration. If you use a K nearest neighbor graph, um, to represent this graph, uh, uh, this node, you don't need anything further uh, than this node, right? Because this is actually uh, just an extension of this in the same direction. Uh, similarly here, uh, you don't need anything uh, further away. So in some way, the NNK graph helps you to sparsify the graph uh, using only the required information from your neighbors. Right? So it's not just a K nearest neighbor graph, but it identified the uh, neighbors uh, that are uh, informative and you get rid of the rest of the connections. Uh, so using this idea of NNK graph, um, this is a paper presented this year in ISIF. Uh, to, uh, using this, uh, this K and NK graph, you can actually achieve better sparsity representation of your signal, in this case, your image, uh, compared to a bi bi uh, bilateral filter graph uh, when you derive your, uh, your graph wavelet based on these graphs. So you can see that uh, the author's proposal, which is the second uh, row here, you have much smaller energy in the high frequencies which means that the, the, the images are actually much more compactly represented in the low frequencies. Yeah, so it leads to a sparse representation of your signal. Uh, so this is the, uh, the first half uh, where we talked about uh, graph learning, uh, different techniques in graph learning. Now we're gonna look at how using these graph learning techniques, we can apply uh, to image compression. So let's talk about uh, image compression. So we first talk about uh, why graph transform makes sense uh, in a coding context first. Now, uh, DCT is frequently used uh, in coding standard. Uh, so uh, for example, JPEG use uh, display cosine transform and they're, six, they're fixed transform. You use the same transform for every eight by eight block, uh, regardless of what the signal is. So the question is, can we do a better job if we uh, make the transform adaptive to the signal? Right? And, and certainly uh, using graph Fourier transform, which uh, UEG has discussed uh, in his slides, uh, we can be signal adaptive. Uh, so let me give you an example. Um, if you have uh, a four by four block where uh, there's a sharp discontinuity in your signal, as you can see here, uh, let's say this is depth map and this is between foreground and background, uh, then certainly you don't want to filter across uh, this signal discontinuity, right? So uh, if you assign weight one uh, to adjacency pixels and then you disconnect uh, the graph here, if there's a sharp signal discontinuity, uh, then when you apply graph transform to the signal, uh, you're essentially avoiding filtering across sharp discontinuity. So that means that you would have uh, a low frequency representation of your signal, uh, 
and would lead to sparse representation and therefore coding game. So this was the original idea that actually goes back 10 years now. Uh, well, with Antonio and his student, Carbon Chen, uh, in a PCS paper, uh, will follow up and actually prove the optimality of these graph transform uh, subject to a, uh, a particular statistical model, which I'm going to talk about next. So again, uh, in this work, we actually show that the graph tra Fourier transform is the optimal transform in terms of uh, signal decorrelation for a particular statistical model, which is this AL process, 1D AL process. So the AL process is, uh, is described here. So essentially, uh, the next pixel is the previous pixel uh, plus some uh, independent noise term, right? So as you move along uh, from pixel uh, two and three and four and so on, is the previous pixel value plus a noise term, right? So this is a very frequently used uh, AL process to describe the statistics uh, of a row of pixels. Uh, of course, the first pixel in this case, we assume will be another random variable uh, with a larger variance. So having this uh, statistical model, uh, you can write it in matrix form for a particular uh, row of n pixels. Uh, so you can write it in matrix form like this where the matrix F uh, and the vector B is defined as such. Um, having written in this form, uh, solving for X, you can look at the uh, covariance matrix of X, which is uh, X, X transpose, and then the inverse of that will be the precision matrix. Right. Uh, so without uh, showing you all the math, it turns out that the inverse covariance matrix in this case uh, is a tri-diagonal matrix, right? So the matrix is entirely zero except for the main diagonal and then the off diagonals above and below it. So it's a, it's a uh, tri-diagonal matrix. Uh, more importantly, this is actually uh, a graph Laplacian matrix corresponding to a line graph with these weights. So uh, the KLT, the cohen lowoff transform, uh, composed of uh, eigenvectors uh, of the covariance matrix. The covariance matrix has the same eigenvectors as the precision matrix. Now, if the precision matrix is essentially the same as the graph Laplacian matrix, that means that the eigenvector of the graph Laplacian matrix uh, are the same as the precision matrix, uh, and therefore the graph Laplacian matrix can decorrelate your signal as well as the KLT. So this proves the optimality of the graph Fourier transform for a particular statistical model, uh, this 1D AL process. Uh, so in this earlier work by uh, Wei, we can actually show that the uh, graph Fourier transform to significantly better than the DCT. So this is not a surprise when you can adapt uh, your, your transform uh, to the statistics of your signal, you can certainly do better. Uh, in particular, uh, as I've shown in the uh, illustration earlier, if you actually disconnect, um, if you actually disconnect uh, sharp discontinuity within a block, uh, you prevent filtering from across uh, sharp edges. So the reproduction actually uh, are much sharper than our, than our counterpart. You can see that uh, our edges are tends to be much sharper uh, than, our, than our competitor. So that's for the case when you actually encode the signal directly. But as you know, in image compression, very often we encode not the signal, but the prediction residual, right? So for example, uh, if you have a row of pixels, uh, x0, it's known because it's been coded in the previous uh, instance. Now you want to code uh, these pixels, uh, x1 to x4. Uh, you can do a prediction from, uh, from the previous known pixels, and then you will code, uh, uh, code the prediction residual. So in this case, uh, how can you uh, show graph transform it's reasonable for coding or prediction residual? So that's the problem we looked at uh, uh, in this paper. Uh, as you see, uh, prediction, uh, intraprediction is used everywhere. This is uh, the case in X264, uh, but certainly is used in, in future codecs as well, like HDDC. So in this case, we also uh, assume uh, autoregressive uh, AL, AL model for rural pixels. Uh, the difference, you look at statistical model, 
uh, it's really in the in the first line here where uh, the pixels the first pixel uh, is the previous known pixel so this guy is known uh, plus a noise term uh, so you can write similarly having the statistical model you can simply write it in matrix form uh, the difference here you have an extra a vector c that accounts for the, the known pixels. Now, uh, using similar math, you can actually, uh, again, compute the covariance matrix, invert it to compute the precision matrix. And again, uh, a tridiagonal matrix shows up. Uh, the only difference compared to the previous case is that it's like this tridiagonal matrix uh, plus a diagonal matrix that accounts for the, uh, the first guy, the first, uh, the first term because you predict them from the known pixels. So uh, this way of representing the matrix as a, this tridiagonal matrix, uh, which is like a Laplacian matrix, uh, plus a diagonal matrix, uh, let's call that D, is called a generalized graph Laplacian matrix, right? The generalized graph Laplacian matrix is a combinatorial graph Laplacian uh, plus a diagonal matrix. So that means that if we uh, do the eigen decomposition of this generalized graph Laplacian, these eigenvectors are the same as the eigenvectors of your precision matrix, right? And therefore, using these eigenvectors, which compose of the GFT, will, will optimally, uh, optimally de uh, decorrelate your signal, just like the KLT would. So this actually proves the optimality uh, of the generalized graph Fourier transform. That's what we call the uh, eigenvectors corresponding to the graph uh, 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 generalized graph Laplacian. This GGFT generalized graph Fourier transform is the eigenvectors corresponding to this generalized graph of uh, So again, not surprisingly, uh, you think GGFT, we can do better than a previous GFT when we call the prediction residual. So I won't uh, dwell on the results here. Uh, carrying on this idea, this is recent work uh, uh, from uh, Hume, one of uh, uh, Antonio's students. Uh, we can actually learn these parameters, right? So when I was talking about this 1D AL process, I assume these parameters are known, and then I prove the optimality of the GFT and GGFT, but in practice, these parameters are certainly not known. You're just given data. So how do you actually optimally compute these parameters uh, is the contribution here. Uh, so the paper started with a discussion that uh, uh, separable transform is important uh, in standards. Uh, for implementation reasons. So uh, very often you would uh, do the filtering in uh, X direction and then Y direction, right? So to make the transform separable. Um, and so if you uh, want to learn the optimal transform for the rows and the columns, you can actually learn the, the, the parameters optimally uh, from by looking at the data. Yeah, so uh, I didn't mention it before, but uh, Actually, these graph transform, this 1D graph transform, these uh, line graphs, actually default to the known transform that we know, like DST and DCT. So by optimizing these parameters from data, you're essentially generalizing from the transform that people are already using when the standards, uh, such as uh, DST and DCT, variants of DST and DCT. Uh, again, I would uh, ask you to look at the details uh, in this reference by Hume. Uh, so another interesting piece of work uh, uh, from Antonio's group uh, is this notion of uh, uh, IAGFT, right, which stands for uh, Irregularity Aware GFT. Uh, so it's motivated uh, as follows. So suppose you have an image block and you have some notion that some pixels are more important than others, right? And when you compute your mean square error, instead of the typical mean square error, you have a, a weighting factor where Q here is a diagonal uh, matrix, basically saying uh, certain pixels are more important than some other pixels. Uh, having this notion of weighted uh, a mean square error uh, would motivate a notion uh, called Q inner product. So instead of saying two, uh, uh, two vectors are orthogonal, uh, so typically you say uh, two vectors are orthogonal of X transpose Y, equal to zero, and then you would say, okay, x is orthogonal to y, right? Uh, 
so in this case, you would actually have a, a matrix Q uh, as well uh, to define. And now you would say a, a vector X transpose QY is orthogonal uh, if, um, if X transpose QY equals to zero. So it turns out that to account for this uh, uh, weighted mean square, you can define this uh, Q inner product, which leads to this notion of Q orthogonality, as I was mentioning, uh, to account for this uh, difference uh, in weight uh, of given pixels. Uh, so this leads to a notion of a uh, uh, generalized eigen decomposition. Uh, because you have this uh, generalized notion of orthogonality, uh, your your uh, your Rayleigh -like quotient will be computed a little bit differently, right? Because the notion of orthogonality is different. So the solution to this problem, this Rayleigh -like, uh, minimi minimization of the Rayleigh -like quotient, leads to the uh, generalized eigen decomposition. Is uh, instead you have these generalized eigenvectors, uh, and you would use those uh, to describe your signal instead of the eigenvectors uh, of a graph of Poisson, a typical graph of Poisson matrix. Uh, so there's some interesting results in the paper. I'll just highlight some of the uh, the key points. If you use this notion uh, of defining orthogonality with respect to the uh, matrix Q, diagonal matrix Q, and let's say you you, you assume the beginning, uh, the first few pixels are more important, you say, see that the energy in the high frequencies are, are very small. What does that mean? What that means is that if you want to, express the signal, the early part of your signal, you have to use the early eigenvectors, right? So that in, as a way, uh, in so doing, you're actually uh, preserving the reconstruction of the first few, uh, the first few pixels. So this is shown uh, in this particular uh, illustration. Uh, compared to the case when you use DCT and there's no, there's no weighting in your pixels, uh, if you use large Q, you have a smaller error. Right, because again, using the low frequency alone, you can well describe your signal already. Uh, the trade-off is you're gonna have a larger error uh, in the cases where you, where you assign a smaller Q. So you see that the overall PSNR is actually worse than the case when you do DCT, but uh, when you look at the uh, SSIM, it's actually much better. So let's look at the compression uh, of images that are not on a uh, 2D grid. So we can look at two cases, uh, the light field images uh, and point clouds uh, attributes. Uh, so these are slides uh, uh, supplied by uh, Thomas and Inria. So thank you for that. Uh, so what are, what are uh, light fields? Light fields are uh, advanced camera where you can capture not only uh, the, uh, the luminance from a, uh, that are aggregated from different direction, but actually you can actually capture the direction uh, of the light that comes in uh, using uh, a smart array of uh, lens slits. And then from that, you can compute these uh, sub-aperture images. Uh, which are essentially uh, images uh, taken from a slightly offset viewpoints of the same static scene. Now having these sub-aperture images, array of uh, sub-aperture images, you can then uh, uh, create uh, different effects, such as uh, viewing of the same scene from different viewpoints, uh, as you've shown here. So this is quite neat, but obviously you have this uh, uh, 2D array of sub-aperture images with lots and lots of redundancies. So how do you uh, design efficient compression algorithm uh, exploiting these redundancies uh, for efficient compression. That's the, that's the key in uh, light field compression. Um, I would skip through some of the, the details here, but the key idea uh, here is the notion of, of super rays, which is a generalization of super pixels, right? Super pixels uh, is the idea of um, a gathering pixels within a local region that are similar and then compressing them together. So that seems like a good idea. Uh, in the case of light fields, not only are you gathering pixels within a local area in an image that are similar for compression, you can also gather a similar spatial region across some aperture images and then code them together. So that's the main idea of super arrays. And you can see how, uh, how the authors uh, group these uh, 
regions together into one uh, to create these uh, uh, super rays. And then you will group, you group these super rays as one unit, uh, exploiting uh, not just spatial correlation, but uh, interview or inter uh, sub aperture image uh, correlation for, for good comp uh, compression. Uh, so when you gather these guys together, uh, spatial regions from different sub-aperture images together, sometimes uh, you have issues such as occlusion. So again, I won't go into the details of that. I'll refer to the paper for, uh, for details. Uh, here's an illustration of how these uh, uh, spatial region across sub-aperture images can be gathered into one super, super race for, for efficient compression. Uh, yeah, I'll skip the details here as well. Uh, so there, there's a notion of uh, how you can reduce complexity uh, by separating uh, the transform in one domain versus the other domain, the spatial domain uh, versus the, the inter-sub-aperture uh, image domain, so that you can uh, have more efficient uh, uh, algorithms instead of doing a really, really large transform. A uh, fast graph transform continue to one of the, the uh, uh, active area of research in this topic, because uh, even though graph transform has been, can be proved to be optimal, uh, implementing them quickly is actually a still, still a challenge. I'll finish off with uh, a discussion on point cloud attribute compression. So this is essentially an application of uh, prediction uh, and coding of prediction residual, but on a uh, non-regular grid. So in this case, the author assumed uh, this is Wei's work in PKU. Um, they assume they're coding uh, point cloud attributes uh, such as uh, color, reflection intensity, uh, and so on, but assuming that the geometry is known. So you have a point cloud in time t, your point cloud in t, t plus one as well. You assume that the, the geometry is known, uh, and then uh, you would code the, the attributes on top, of, on, on top of this geometry. Uh, of course, the, the construction of the graph is important, in this case, they assume that uh, if there's similar geometry, then the, the attribute will be similar as well. Uh, so they, they, they construct a graph based on geometry and then they use this constructed graph uh, to code point cloud attributes. Uh, so the optimal prediction actually can be shown, uh, given that you have a graph, the optimal prediction uh, can be computed fairly easily. Uh, you can look at uh, Chad Zhang's earlier work from, from Microsoft here. And then the, uh, the optimal transform, it's very much similar to the, the, uh, uh, the generalized uh, graph Fourier transform that I talked about earlier. Uh, so I won't go into the details of that, but that's the, that's the main, main idea for, uh, for prediction and coding. Uh, so we show some uh, performance gain here with respect to the, uh, some standard coding uh, algorithm. Again, I will refer to you to the details refer the details of the paper to her paper. So let's make, let me quickly conclude. Uh, uh, so uh, using graph-based techniques to code imaging data, uh, it's a very good idea. One of the reasons because uh, graph is a very flexible abstraction. So uh, if you have a way of conveying pixel similarity, uh, then, then uh, the eigenvectors, the low frequencies can represent your signal very well. Now, similarity can be defined with respect to correlation uh, using some of these graph learning algorithms that I talked about from a statistical perspective, or it can be defined uh, using uh, a feature distance, notion of feature distance. They're both valid, uh, not saying one is better than the other. It's very application dependent. Uh, graph is also a, a good way of expressing a domain knowledge. So if a priori, you know, certain pixels are, are, are related, there's a notion of similarity that you can uh, derived from domain knowledge, that's a good way of expressing that as a graph. Uh, as you've sh as we've shown in Hume's work, for example, uh, when you learn these parameters for separable transforms, if you're able to uh, constrain the parameters that you learn in your learning model by use by imposing a graph structure, that means you're learning few number of param parameters, and therefore your learning is actually more robust. So this is actually one of the driving reasons why, instead of just using statistical approach. Uh, using a graph-based approach and then imposing a structure on top, you learn fewer number of parameters uh, and you achieve more robust learning. 
Uh, finally, there are many different tricks of doing uh, a fast graph transform. This is still a topic of, uh, uh, of investigation. Uh, so Hume looked at this in terms of separable transform. Uh, uh, Thomas and his, uh, and his colleague Mira look into this uh, by dividing the transform into separate domain, the spatial domain, and then inter sub, -sub aperture image domain uh, so that you can do the, the filtering separately. Uh, so there's still a lot more work uh, in this direction. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Uh, please look up uh, relevant work in my homepage. Uh, it contains some, some papers that are available uh, and also email me for more uh, questions if you have any. Uh, thank you for listening.